For GIS Lab 3, we're going to be working with raster data, which is going to look pretty different than the vector data that we've been dealing with in the other labs. Some other things that we're going to learn in this lab is um, using Arc Toolbox, which is a, a application set that contains lots and lots of different tools, but we're going to see a couple of them today. And we're also going to be looking at a subset of raster data called uh, DEMs, or Digital Elevation Models, which are um, pretty useful in civil engineering. So to get started, we're going to start with a blank GIS map. So we're going to open Arc Map and just go under New Maps and just hit Blank Map, which gives us just a blank area to work with. The first thing to get a sense of where we're at, we're going to add the Washington State Counties. So under the Z Drive, under Class and Data, Washington, we're going to find this county layer, which is a shape file. So this is not raster data. This is vector data or area data, where it shows all the maps or the counties of uh, Washington State. We're going to be adding data over this, so we want to change it so it has no fill. And we're going to go ahead and darken up the county borders. Kind of optional, if we wanted to, we could label features and we could get the county names. Just kind of a review of what we were doing in other labs. So now to bring in the raster data, we want to go back to the catalog, but instead of stay in Washington, but we want to look for this subfolder within Washington called precipitation events. So under precipitation events, I see a lot of layers. I can tell from the way it's um, this icon that shows kind of a, a bunch of grids that it's raster data. And there's lots of different precipitation events that I can bring in. And I know you're probably dealing with these types of uh, data in your hydrology class. But we're going to be looking for the 24-hour, 100-year storm event. So if I bring it in, you'll see that it extends a little bit beyond Washington. We're going to be dealing with that um, issue in a later step. But we see that it goes from dark to light. And I can look over here, and I can see that the higher values are lighter, and the darker values are um, uh, closer to black. So I want to bring up the property menu. We've been doing lots of uh, work with the property layers in the various labs. So first thing I want to do is change the layer name so that it's clear that the layer is talking about precipitation events. So it has the 24-hour, 100-year. And I want to go over to Symbology. So we did a lot in the last lab with Symbology. It's going to look a little different because this is raster data, so we get kind of different uh, choices over here. But it still has this option with a color ramp. So this is what we use for our chlorophleth map last GIS lab. So I want to find a color ramp. There's lots of different choices that sort of relate to um, precipitation. So this one down here has kind of red for um, low values and blue for high values. So I could use that one. And the last thing in here is I want to make it clear on the map that the units are in inches. So I can see that I have a high. So somewhere in the state, a 100-year, 24-hour storm event would mean 22.82 inches of rain fell during that 24-hour period. And then the low for that same uh, storm return period would be 1.69. So if I hit Apply, then you can see as probably expected, that the high precipitation um, would occur in the mountains and the Olympic Peninsula with the drier parts of the state over here um, on the east. So zooming in, you can see why it's called gridded data or raster data. Right. So each, the f entire storm or the entire state is covered with grids with each cell sort of representing a single value. So a couple things that are different about raster data. One, if I were to go over and right click and try to open the attribute table. So normally on vector data, I'd bring up a whole um, table where I could see all the different attributes associated with that da data layer. Raster data, that isn't an option. Um, all raster data contains is one single value for that sort of geographic extent of the single grid. So let's explore this a little bit by kind of going up and looking at our identify tool. So if I were to pick on one of these cells, so the first thing is, is you'll notice I picked it, and it wants to pick the county. So it's telling me that what I picked was actually King County. That was on the top. 
I could either change and put precipitation on top of the county, or I can limit my identify tool to only give me information about a particular layer. So I'm going to do that and um, limit it to precipitation. So then when I go and click different cells, I'll be able to get the information about that. It's going to tell me the location, which is going to be um, just the, the coordinates for that particular uh, grid that I'm doing. But here is the pixel value. So that's the only value that can be stored in a raster data. It's a single one. So it's telling me that for that cell that I picked, or th that the 100-year storm event was 10.19 inches of rain. And so if I were to go and pick a yellow cell, which I would expect to be drier, you'll see that it's 4.69. Okay, so we want to zoom extent so we can see all of our data at once. And as I mentioned when we brought it in, that the raster data layer that we're using with the storm events extends beyond Washington State. So the next sort of steps is using an Arc Toolbox tool to clip it so that it we don't get any data outside of Washington State. So before we start using Arc Toolbox, uh, I want to point out how we need to make sure that the extensions that we're going to use are um, activated for our license. So if you go up under Customize and look at um, under Extensions, we want to make sure that this spatial analyst is checked. So in general, um, if we weren't to do that and then we were to go and use some of the tools in this lab, we would get an error that would look like um, that we had a licensing error and that we needed to purchase additional software. So in general, with our campus license for these Esri GIS products, we have um, everything, access to all features. So if you ever get an, an error like that, either in this class or any other class, um, go ahead and let, ask either me or the lab assistants or the um, to, to see about it because we do have access to everything and everything has been purchased so if you ever get an error that looks like you need to purchase additional software then it's usually just an issue of not having the extension actually activated or um, loaded and it's just that the nature of the errors is written such that it doesn't it looks like we just need to pay for something when that's not the case but anyway um, and the, this would activate all the spatial analyst tools within this Arc Toolbox. This Arc Toolbox is up here at the top, and it looks just like a toolbox. And if you bring it up, um, there's lots and lots of different tools within um, within Arc Toolbox, and we're only going to be using a handful of them. Okay, for this step, we're going to be clipping our raster data and using the Arc Toolbox feature. So up at the top, if we bring up the Arc Toolbox, there's um, lots of different sort of subsets of tools, but we're going to be using the data management tools and then going down here to raster. And under um, raster processing, we'll see a clip tool. So it'll bring it up. And all the formats of the Arc Toolbox tools sort of um, follow a pretty general convention. So if it has a green dot next to it, it means that it's a input that's required. And then the other ones, if it doesn't have a green dot, are um, optional. Yours might have the hide help and show help feature different. But as you move around the toolbox, you will get um, help over here um, that's uh, specific to the, the box that you have highlighted. So um, I think it's helpful to always keep the, the help on because there's so many tools within GIS, nobody knows all of them. But anyway, so as we look at this clip feature, we have um, both the input raster um, and then some output features and, and then where it's going to ultimately be saved. So a couple of things. So first, we're going to bring up um, our input raster. It will show any um, all, all the available layers within our current map that are raster data, but we only have one with this precipitation. So I'm going to bring this up and to show um, a common issue with it. So if I bring this up, I'm actually getting an error. Um, I see the red X. If I hover over it, it's saying that it either doesn't exist or it's not supported. Well, I know for a fact that it exists because we can see it within our map layer. So that means that it's not supported. So earlier at the at the beginning of this lab, I talked about the. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of this and bring up 
the the issue with spaces. And one of the hard things about ArcGIS is that uh, it doesn't support spaces within sort of file names, but the issue is is that it allows these spaces to exist until you try to execute particular tools. So it can be kind of confusing because I think at the onset, if it just told you that you had a file name error, then um, it wouldn't be so complicated. But actually, in the earlier step, I was over here when I brought in this um, precipitation layer and I named it. I actually named it with a couple of spaces. It has a space in between and there is actually was a space at the very beginning. And so if I go and rename it and now go back to my tools and use my clip. Oh, I don't know why I'm constantly getting this window security thing. Yes. Um, I can bring up the precipitation and now you'll see that it'll accept that. So input raster, once I did that, um, put that layer in, it pre-populated the sort of uh, rectangle that it would do. So it would um, go ahead and clip it based on the sort of extent of that, that raster. But what I want to use is an optional, I want to use a shape file. So I want it to clip it to some other feature that I have in my map. And the feature that I have is my county 10. So it's going to use my county boundaries as a way of clipping. There's some other optional things in here um, that we want to look at. We want to use the input features for clipping geometry, meaning that we want, instead of forcing it to be a pure rectangle, we want to use this to allow, um, so it's going to exactly match the shape of Washington, which is certainly not rectangular. If I didn't have that on there, it would sort of clip it um, in a strange way. I'd get gaps. It forces it to have the same amount of um, height and width across the whole state. And then the last one I want to make sure is this clipping extent. And then it's going to create a new raster data set. So it's going to take this um, input one, which we got, and it's going to create a new one. So instead of um, GIS rarely create situations where you can um, sort of destroy data. So because we want to create a subset of it, it's going to ask us where we want to save it. So we want to go ahead and put it in our own folder and we can name it whatever we want. I will warn you that it doesn't like more than 13 characters. So we'll see if I so once again we get this um, error so single band grid cannot have more than 13 characters so it's going to want something shorter than that so we'll go ahead and call it this but be sure you put it in your own folder so once I click on that it'll get rid of that error and then I'll hit OK and then it looks like nothing's happening but if I look down here at the lower part of my screen I can see that it's executing the command um, if you uh, did get an error once this went away um, in the lower right part of your screen it would come up um, and there'd be a, like a red box that you could check that would give you the actual name of the error and the, like I said the most common one is that you have some sort of space in your file name or your path name or something like that but we'll click this and you'll see that it created a new layer which we'll want to um, go ahead and use our color ramp again the same thing that we did in that earlier step and then I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the other one and I could um, right click on it and go ahead and hit remove okay for this uh, step we're going to be creating contour lines or vector data from raster data but before I started talking about those steps I wanted to point out a couple things and link um, some of the GIS features to what we've been talking about in class so one of them is as we move around our pointer we'll see down here in the um, you know the lower right that the numbers are changing and these are actually the coordinate system if we wanted to know what coordinate system we were using we could go to the um, 
the layers and hit properties. So this is the property for the entire layers. And we'll, um, over here on the coordinate system tab, we can get information about it. And so it sees, it shows that we're using the North American datum 1983 using the HARN, the high accuracy. Um, and here we get the information about state planes. So we're in, if you remember that there's state plane coordinates, there's a northern system and a southern system. So the coordinates that we're seeing um, are based on Washington uh, South. And um, we also get some information about how it's being projected, right? And so we started with a blank map. And the reason that our data showed up this way was the very first layer that we put in was for Washington counties. And it is inherently projected and in that and that projection system and has the state plane coordinates. And so by putting that first layer in, it used that. So. Um, it doesn't mean that um, all maps just sort of default to a Washington projection. It just sort of waits for that. So anyway, as we move around, we can see those numbers change, and that's showing us the state plane coordinates. The other thing that we talked about in lecture recently was the map scale. So as we sort of zoom in and out, we'll see these values change, right? And so we get a sense of, you know, if we're zooming out, that number gets larger and larger as our map gets smaller and smaller and as we zoom in that second number gets smaller right as we take up more of the screen if I right click or if I go down um, click that down arrow and hit the customize list it's going to show me a bunch of standard um, values right and so I could move around between that but I can also customize this list right I can add additional ones that allow me to sort of zoom or um, move to standard uh, scales, but also I could change the the format of it. I could say that I want it to be um, inches to miles. I could add create new ones where we use inches to feet, which is more standard for construction projects, right? And so if I wanted to, one inch equals five miles, right? One inch equals five hundred miles, right? I can just go back and forth. This becomes more important as we, um, if we're in layout view and we want to create maps that are exactly, that have uh, reasonable scales. When we're in data view, it's usually just whatever we want, but I wanted to point out that's where we would change it. Okay, so for creating contour lines, and what we're going to be using is we're going to be creating isohyate lines, which are um, like contour lines for precipitation. Right? I think you're probably using them in your um, geology hydrology class. But if I go to our toolbox again, and then near the bottom, I see the spatial analyst tools. And find the surface tool. And under that is contours. So this is the first time we're going to be creating um, data, a different data type from from another data type. So we're going to be, our input ras is going to be in raster and we're going to output into vectors. So I'm just going to get this security every time, I guess. Okay. My input raster is going to be my precipitation event. I want to make sure that I output it not to the class folder, but that I put it in my folder. So 100 year, 24 hour. So the contour intervals, we're going to set it to 2. Leave the base contour. And over here is our um, Z factor. So this is um, important if we wanted to change the units. So it's going to default, and it's an optional one, so we don't have to do anything with it. But it defaults to 1, meaning that it's going to use the units, and it's not going to convert any of the data. But once again, if I kind of go over here and look at the help, you can see this example. So if I had data in feet and I wanted to change it to meters, right, I could put in a factor of 0.3048. Um, if I wanted to change, right now it's in inches, if I wanted to change it to feet, right, I could do, um, you know, the inverse of 12 and it would convert that data. So I'm going to hit OK. You can see down here it's running. 
and now I get my um, isohyal or, or precipitation contour lines. So looking at our map with these isohyate lines, we can see that it's created these vector sort of contour lines at every two inch interval. So it took the raster data, which was a continuous coverage, and sort of summarized it in a more compact way uh, by showing these uh, precipitation lines. So a couple things that we're going to work on with the properties of this newly created layer. So one, um, the first is symbology. So right now it um, defaults to looking at the um, the contour lines, showing all contours the same. So we want to create a symbology where the the 10 inch and the 20 inch lines are shown darker. So how we do this, we make sure our value field, um, this newly created line only has an ID for each contour, and then it has the contour, which is the the height or the value. Uh, precipitation in inches. So we want to add a couple of values. So by adding the 10 inch and the 20 to this, we can change these into heavier black lines. Let's make them black um, with a two, a weight of two, and maybe black with two, and then all other values are going to remain what they are, with one inch and kind of the burgundy color. So if I hit apply, you'll be able to see it makes those um, darker. The other part is labels. So if I wanted to label it so that only the 10 inch and 20 inch were labeled, as opposed to labeling every contour, um, I'll go over to the labels. So in previous labs, we've done this where we've, um, you know, set the label field and we've made sure we're labeling. But in this case, we want to, um, instead of labeling all features the same way, we want to define classes of features and label them differently. So by selecting this, you'll see that I get um, some information about the class. So I want to set up another query. So we used queries in the previous lab, so we're going to use them here, and this is just going to say uh, define which ones are going to get features. So I'm going to set my contour equal to 10 inch, and I'm going to set it as an or condition, right? So if it's one or the other, it's going to label it. So contour equal 20. So it creates that. It's going to label it. It's going to label it based on the um, contour. And the last thing I want to look at is some of the placement properties. So this sets where it's going to get labeled. Um, I think it usually defaults down to the page, but you want to label it based on the line. So it's going to uh, rotate the label so that it um, is uh, to the left or sort of what looks like above or below the line and it's going to rotate it um, so it's oriented with the line. So I hit that and hit apply. And now if I see I've got my 10 inch lines are thicker and I can see that I now have a label above it. The same as I probably have to go out to the Olympic Peninsula to start to see some of the, the 10s and the 20s. So these ones are 20 inch lines and 10. So that shows some of the other features for labeling that we didn't use last time. Okay, for the next step we're going to be creating raster data from vector data. So the last step we created this vector data, these contours, from a raster file and then this for this step we're going to be creating a raster file from vector data but we're going to be using point data or uh, city location. So the first step we can go ahead and zoom out and turn off our ISA highlight lines, go over to the catalog, and back here, class, data, Washington. We want to find this layer at the end that's Washington cities. It's a point layer. It's a shape file. We can see from the icon that it is um, defined as point data. And we can bring that in. 
if we opened up the attribute table, we would see that it was point data that showed um, 494 cities in the state of Washington. So to create, we're going to create a raster data, which is going to be a continuous coverage gridded data that's going to, um, for every cell, uh, talk about or, or provide a value that tells you how many, um, how close it is to any of these cities. So if we bring up our Arc Toolbox, so once again under um, Spatial Analyst, this time we want to go to the distance. I wanted to point out that as we highlighted any of these tools, there's hundreds of tools in Arc Toolbox. Just note that down here at the bottom of the, the screen, it'll give a short description of those. There's so many tools that nobody knows, you know, can know all, all of them or be familiar with every tool within uh, Arc Map. So it's kind of handy if you're trying to hunt around for uh, a tool that's going to do what you need it to do that you can just kind of highlight and, and see the quick description. But anyway, for um, ours, we're going to be using Euclidean distance. So it's going to um, calculate the distance from every grid on our raster layer to another um, another point or another feature. We could also have it do direction, so this can be useful if you're trying to figure out slopes, like create a surface that talks about the, the slopes, like for, um, you know, uh, rainfall runoff. There's also distances and all kinds of what we call cost allocation, but in this case we're going to um, use this Euclidean distance. It's going to bring up, like I said, all these ARC toolboxes um, have similar format, so we, it shows that we have two things, both an input and an output. I have a new version of Windows. I assume that that's what all this ActiveX stuff is coming from. But Okay, so it's saying the input raster or featured data source, so it's not limited to just point data, but we want to set it at cities, and then it's saying here's the output. So we want to set it so that it's going to our individual, so it's going to go to my GIS Lab 3 folder, and I can call it whatever I want. I'll call it city distance, so distance to each city. It sets the output um, size. This um, describes how large each cell is going to be. Um, in most cases, you're just going to want to let that default. So we can see down here, it's creating the surface. And then you'll see that we have this, this uh, gridded surface. If I were to go in here, you can see that it's raster data. Each cell has a value. The other thing is we can see that parts of Washington State are missing, so it can't um, extrapolate past. So you can see that it looks at you know this last city over here, and it can't go further to the west. And the same thing out here, it can't go further to the east. So, um, but looking at the values, right? So yellow are close to the cities, and then as it gets more um, pink and blue and purple, those are more remote. So I want to go and do the same thing that we did in a previous step where we clipped it. So the next step will be clipping it back so that we don't have any of this, this data out here on the edges. So if you remember back at Arc Toolbox, we were when we were doing the clipping, we were up here in this data management tool. So we're up here with um, raster, raster processing, and clip. So the input raster we want to change this city distance. We want to use the counties. 
We want to select these two options. And we can go ahead and call it remoteness. So you can see that it's working down here at the bottom, that it's processing. As you get larger and larger data sets, sometimes this can take 10 minutes, 20 minutes. So it's always good to have that feedback that it's working. So I'm going to go ahead and shut this down. And now we see this remoteness surface. I want to change it so that it has a different color ramp. And the other thing here is it's in feet. So it's telling me that my most remote um, location within the state of Washington is 259,000 feet away from a city. We're going to, in the future, the next step, change this into miles so that it's more easy to be interpreted. But you can hit apply. Okay, for this step, we're going to be using the raster calculator, which is a way of doing simple algebraic manipulations of any raster data. So as you remember from earlier steps that raster is this gridded data and each cell has um, one value associated with it. So in the previous step we created this remoteness very, uh, layer that for every cell it tells how many feet in sort of you, in Euclidean distance it is to the nearest city. And so we get this continuous surface based on that. Um, we clipped it to the Washington. We have certain areas out here that have missing data just because there were no point data to create from it. So what we want to do for this step is to convert this layer instead of being in feet, which it used because the map units were in feet, we want to it to be measured in miles instead. So if we go to our um, ARC toolbox, we're going to go back to um, our spatial analyst. And under Spatial Analyst, we're going to be looking for Map Algebra and the map, a Raster Calculator. And you can see here it's a processing tool for performing raster analysis of Map Algebra expression. So we can do simple algebraic math on these values. So this is what the Raster Calculator looks like. So it's showing us which um, layers that we can use this feature for and it's only going to show us our uh, raster so we're going to use the remoteness and we're going to divide it by 5280 so this would take all of our values in feet and for every cell it would divide it by 5280 this is my output I want to make sure it goes to my file and I'm going to call it remoteness and miles oh, it's not going to like that it's going to be too long there it goes limited by the 13 characters and hit OK. You can see down here that it's processing. It's going to keep the same extents, right? So it's not changing the location of any of these grids and or the extents of it. It's just going to um, be doing simple math on it. And so over here in the table of contents I can see now instead of having it in feet um, I now have it down to miles. I'm going to go ahead and change the color ramp into something that's easier to interpret. Doesn't matter which one. 
and I'm going to get rid of some of these significant figures. And remoteness and miles. Since I'm not going to be doing any more manipulation or analysis on this layer, I can go ahead and keep the space or have it be more than 13 characters. Um, yeah. and then I can get a map that looks like that. So you can see where some of the more remote. You can imagine how right now it's just using all whatever 494 cities. You could do a query that would reduce the cities. Maybe you were only considered a city um, over 10,000 in population and then could do a new kind of remoteness to maybe some sort of major towns, major cities, and whatnot, and that would change the, the layer that you just created. So we want to continue using the raster calculator to show some of the um, additional features that it can do. So for this part, we're going to use the raster calculator first to normalize some data, and I'll talk about that in a second, and then also to add um, attributes from multiple raster data. So for this, I've, I've taken um, my layers, and, and we're going to be using this um, remoteness that we just created in miles, and also the um, the rain data that we had. So just a reminder of what that looked like, where we had the, the rainy and the drier areas, um, as defined by a 24-hour, 100-year storm event. Right. So in order for me to combine these two, I need to put them on the same scale. So I can't just, if I were to add, I can't just add miles and inches of rainfall in a 100-year storm event. I need to kind of put them on, on the same scale, and that's called normalizing. So the easiest way to normalize data is to just um, put it on a 0, 1 to scale. And so that would allow me, you know, I would see areas of, of high remoteness and um, high rainfall in the same. So to do that, remember that with this raster data that every cell every, um, has a, a data value. If I were to divide every cell, cell by its highest, um, by this high value, so for rain, if I were to divide every cell by 22.82, I would force all the data to fall between 0 and 1. The same thing for the remoteness. If I were to divide every um, cell by 49.1, I would force it to be between 0 and 1. And then this would allow me to, um, you know, since they were normalized onto the same scale, that I could then add them. And if I were to add them together, the highest values would be ones that would be um, high rain and high remoteness. So we're going to use the raster calculator. Once again, that was under the Spatial Analyst Tool Map Algebra Raster Calculator. So first I'm going to take the remoteness I don't know how to get rid of that and I'm going to divide it by 49.1 and I'm going to call it remote norm for normalized and hit OK So you see that I get, an, it's going to have the same sort of uh, relative values. It's just going to be normalized. I'm going to see from between 0 and 1. And actually, because I have a little bit of rounding error, but I can go and essentially change that to 1. And I can use my raster calculator again. It's going to And for this one, I'm going to divide by 22.82. I probably, I needed to change the name, but I'll do that after the fact. Okay. 
norm. So this is my rain normalized. I'm just going to change it essentially from 0 to 1. So now I have these two values. So areas of high rain are closer to 1, and areas of high remoteness are closer to 1 as well. So I can use the raster calculator again and just add these since I put them on a common scale. I have a new version of Windows and I apparently have to change my security settings. But So if I add the normalized rain and the normalized remoteness. I make sure I put it in my own folder and called it rain plus remote. So one thing sometimes with the raster calculators, you um, have different grid sizes. It's always going to sort of default to the largest grid size, and it's going to um, it's still able to do the math. It's just it, the output grid is restricted by the grid size, the largest grid size. So now I have this rain plus remote. Okay, so with this I can um, maybe just change the properties a little bit. I can say worst to best. This is assuming that we like l low rain and we like our cities. I can change it so um, maybe I want to make it green has low values, red has high values, and hit apply. And we can see I can get rid of these other ones. And actually, once they're created, I can even remove them. I did everything in using three steps, but you can use, I could have done them all. I could have done the normalizing function and the addition function in a single raster calculator um, algebraic expression, but I thought it was easier to sort of show the normalizing steps separate. But anyway, you can see these areas that are high remoteness and high rain and um, anyway, you can see how you can combine these things. So the last part of this lab dealing with uh, raster data is going to be looking at a special type of raster data called DEMs, or Digital Elevation Models. So we'll go over to the catalog, and under Washington and DEMs, there's four of them but we're going to bring in this Spokane DEM. And we'll get this geographic coordinate system warning. So this is saying that the DEM is actually was created using a 1927 datum. And as you'll remember, we're using the 1983 HARN. And so it's going to go through a transformation process. So you get this warning that just says that unless there's a, a, a correct algorithm to go between those those two coordinate systems, you might get accuracy issues. But since both this 1927 and the 1983 are pretty common datums, um, we're not too concerned. And when we bring it in, you'll see that it did um, come in where we expected. So I'm going to turn off some of these other layers that we created and zoom in to Spokane. So DEMs are elevation models. They're done in quarter sections, so the same as the USGS maps you're probably using in your hydrology class. But um, as we talked about the public land survey system and the township and rains and the ranges and the different sections, a quarter section map would um, just be one one quarter of a particular section map, and this one is for um, Spokane. And so a DEM is a raster data. If we zoom in, this one is pretty. Um, tight resolution. DEMs either come in 10 meter or 
30 meter grids. So for every cell, it's either 10 by 10 meters or 30 by 30 meters, and there's a single elevation. And if we were to go and look at um, the data from it, let's limit it to the Spokane. It would just have um, a particular value. Um, this happens to be 576. So if you know anything about the elevation of Spokane, you know that it's around, well, um, about, I think, 2,200 feet. So one of the things that should jump out is this 576 if it's an elevation. It actually happens to be um, DEMs are done in meters. So the step that we're going to use the raster calculator to um, convert it to feet, and then um, we'll do some a little bit with the display. So going back to our raster calculator, we want to use our Spokane DM. So if this is in meters and we want to get it to feet, we need to multiply by a conversion, 3.2080 feet per meter. I'm going to make sure it goes to mine, and we're going to say DM, or how about Spokane feet. So it's completed. I'll turn off the old one, bring on the new one, and zoom out a little bit so we can see the whole thing. You can see the Spokane River coming through. This is Hangman Valley, right, and makes the bend. So we're somewhere up in here for Gonzaga's campus. But if I want to go to Properties and Symbology, there's an um, option here where it says Use Hillshade Effect. And if I hit Apply to that, what it does is it, it views this as elevation data and it creates kind of a, a topographic or a hill shade so we can visually see the topography a lot better. Okay, so we're done with all the, the lab exercises and so the only thing that remains is for you to do the assignment for this lab. So I wanted to kind of go over some of the requirements that you'll see in the the lab uh, Word document. So you're going to be working out in Jefferson County, which is out over the Olympic Peninsula. So you can use this uh, file that we've already created, but you can get rid of a lot of the layers since we won't be um, using those. Um, I'm going to zoom out here. So Jefferson County is out in here. We're only going to be uh, working with one uh, tiny little section of it. It's just one DEM, so a quarter section part of it. Um, and you're going to be using um, definition queries like we did in previous labs where you um, want to use a query so that all the other counties go away and you only have Jefferson County left. You're going to bring in the DEM. It's going to be in meters. It's going to be needed to be converted to feet. With that, you're going to um, also create the one-foot um, isohyatt lines using the 100-year, 24-hour storm surface or storm data that we were using before. You also want to create a new raster that's based on the slope in percent of each um, of the cells in the DEM. So this is a tool that we haven't used, but it's um, very similar to one that we use with under the Spatial Analyst uh, Surface tool. So um, part of this exercise is for you to sort of explore that part of the ARC toolbox and see if you can find a tool that would um, provide you the, the slope. And then the last part of it is using the raster calculator and where you want to somehow combine the um, slope data and the rainfall intensity data to figure out areas that might have high likelihood of landslides. So you need to weight those two criteria. So before you can weight them and add them together, you need to normalize them. So kind of go back and review the steps we did when we came up with our remoteness, our um, sort of our, our good measure that um, sort of good to worse where we combined remoteness and rainfall. So you're going to do something similar, but you're going to come up with your own weighting system. 
end, you're going to create a map for it. I will warn you that um, anytime you're dealing with raster data, you're going to have um, raster data of two different size cells, and it's always going to default to the larger cell. So you're actually going to end up with a map that has um, pretty big blocks. Um, when you zoom into the scale, the, um, the rainfall data is going to um, result in having um, pretty low resolution. So that's just something that you're going to have. You're going to create a map. You're going to be graded on your map design. But you're also going to put this into a one-page document where you're explaining your criteria and you're also explaining your process. So this is kind of gearing us up for uh, doing the final project so I can give you some feedback on sort of putting uh, GIS maps and GIS analysis into text form and talking about that. So uh, good luck and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.